Hello SCP fans, welcome to another episode of SCP Cafe. I'm your host, Blue Soul, SCP Wiki moderator, chat operator, subreddit moderator, author, devoted husband, dog lover, writer, and so on. 2019, week one, part two. Uh, leading into this, I have some bad news. We have too many skips to cover this week. Uh, the number of skips is too damn high. And unfortunately, that means I have to make a fairly large change with my plans for this week. And I've been really on the fence on the best way to go about this. I've uh, asked around, gotten opinions from a number of people, because I, I wanted to be confident that uh, any decision I made uh, kind of made sense to the community at large. Uh, basically, I could go one of two ways. I could try to really condense and really, really, really condense the recap format and uh, still try to cover all of the skips uh, in a given week. Uh, one problem I could see with that is that the amount of time spent is going to be very dependent on the number of skips reviewed. Um, this week, we're looking at, I think, when all said and done, 24 skips to cover this week. Uh, that's not a final number, but I think it's going to be in that ballpark. So my second option is to go through all of these skips and read them thoroughly and sort of bring you the ones that I feel are uh, particularly worth discussion and stick with the, the amount of time that I've been giving these articles, which has been anywhere between 8 and 20 minutes. Uh, I think 7 minutes has been the shortest so far on a 250 order, and I think a couple of these have gone up into the low 20s. So uh, the community at large has said almost, well, actually, there's no almost about it. They've universally said that uh, that is what they would prefer to see. Um, I've said in the past, I don't consider myself uh, a real expert on uh, what constitutes a good skip. I, uh, uh, you guys seem to think otherwise. Uh, I am humbled. I appreciate the uh, vote of confidence. I will do my best to uh, really give you guys the best of what the wiki has to offer. This is not what I intended for the pod, but circumstances are kind of forcing my hand on the issue. I simply don't have enough time to get to every one of these and give them the attention that I'm that I've been giving. Uh, recording uh, a particular review uh, is basically a half hour investment uh, to both read the entry and then do the recording and then listen to the playback and uh, make sure that everything sounds uh, as good as uh, as good as I can make it right now. Uh, we're looking at about half an hour apiece, and like I said, we have 24 skips uh, thereabouts this week, so do the math there. That's uh, 12 hours, and I really can't commit 12 hours a week to uh, this pod, not to mention that the total runtime of 24 skips could, you know, could be something like six hours a week. And I don't think uh, you listeners, uh, despite how much you may like the show, I don't think you want six hours of content a week either. Uh, that's way too much. So we have to do something. And what we're going to try is uh, just trying to filter out and give you the best of what the wiki has to offer in a week. And if it's not necessarily the best that it has to offer, I may also uh, occasionally pick out ones that I think are compelling in some other way uh, or notable SCPs. We have a Series 1 rewrite of note um, that I have not read yet. I'm going to give that a little time and uh, make the decision on whether or not it will be included. But I do intend to, going forward, uh, at least for the time being, uh, do the weekly recap on uh, one show, one shot, somewhere between an hour and 90 minutes in length, and try to fit however many skips I can into that time that are uh, worth mention for the week. This is a bit of a deviation from what I said I was going to be doing with the podcast, and I, uh, I apologize for that. Uh, the first week of this, I only had six all week. Uh, this week, I have 24 and if I had 24 in week one, I would have changed the uh, scope of this or my intent of it 
I'd have changed it up a little bit just in response to that because I'd have known at the time that that was not really a uh, maintainable number. So uh, all that said, uh, I would understand if you decided this wasn't the show for you at this point. Um, that does put me in the position of having to be sort of the arbiter uh, of what's going on the pod. And if, you know, if that is something that you disagree with, I, I totally get it. Uh, I still intend to be as impartial as I can. Uh, if something is worth bringing to your attention, I will bring it to your attention re- regardless of any uh, backstory, any site drama. I really try to stay away from all of that stuff and uh, I will do my very best to be an impartial purveyor of skips for your enjoyment. Now, one thing that I'm going to do to try to level the playing field, as it were, um, I make use of an extension that I developed for uh, Chrome and Firefox uh, called SCSSP, um, and I'll link that on the scp.cafe homepage. Uh, but there is an option to hide the rating module. So going forward, I'm going to be browsing the wiki without the benefit of a rating module. That also means I'm probably not going to be including the ratings of the skips going forward. Um, and there's another reason for that, too. Uh, given that we run these shows to cover skips posted from Friday to Thursday, and then I review them on Friday, it can sort of unfairly skew numbers in favor of stuff that got posted on Friday and Saturday versus the stuff that got posted on Wednesday and Thursday. So uh, the rating, truth be told, is not that important in the grand scheme of things. Uh, Very rarely does it matter. Uh, What is more important, uh, honestly, is uh, how you feel about it. So uh, removing the visibility of the rating entirely, I think, will be a... uh, a good thing. I don't think the rating should have any bearing on whether or not I review it anyway, if I think it's good. Lastly, you may notice the sound quality on this one is a little different than previous episodes. Um, I'm still trying to get dialed in on my setup here, so uh, I am curious. I'm always curious how you feel about the sound quality. This one is going to be quite different. It's going to be dramatically different from any of the previous shows, and I'm sure you've noticed already. Um, if you haven't, don't tell me. Uh, I don't want to know that because the uh, prep on this is quite a bit longer. But uh, if you do notice, I'm curious what you think about it. So, uh, you know, please uh, give me your feedback. I always want to know how you guys feel about this show and uh, all the facets of it. All that being said, we're going to get started. We have seven SCPs to review this week, including 1J, um, and I suppose not including the six that we covered in part one. So uh, if you haven't heard part one, go ahead and give that a listen and uh, meet me back here. Uh, these seven represent the best of uh, the best of everything else that I uh, didn't get to in part one. So uh, there were something in the area of 24 qualifying skips and the seven are what I uh, thought to be the most interesting and uh, most worthy of discussion of the bunch. So kicking things off, we have SCP-3634, titled In Vino Veritas, and written by Ip. Uh, you're greeted with a picture of uh, what looks like an old-fashioned key with... Uh, it's sort of an ornamental key. I don't think this would uh, work for anything. And on a little closer inspection, it looks like uh, it's got a bottle opener on one side, and uh, you have a little bit of a hint very early on in the description that it's actually a corkscrew. So... Uh, it's uh, the picture is of the key on both sides, and it says in the caption, both sides of SCP-3634 displaying the in vino veritas text. So we have an object class of safe and uh, fairly standard procedures um, should be contained in a standard containment locker as a low priority anomaly. And uh, dash A instances are considered a level two biohazard and stored as such. And the creation of new dash A instances is only to be carried out by approval from the site director and two senior staff members. And that testing of dash A as an aid for interrogation has been suspended due to the impracticality of implementation. So it leaves us with some questions in the beginning. Uh, this key that we're looking at seems to be able to make things and, uh, we could potentially use them to interrogate, but as it stands, it's not terribly practical. SCP-3634 is described as a corkscrew and its case, so that would be why it didn't look like much of a corkscrew. It's apparently in a case. 
Um, it's described as being composed of iron and resembles a skeleton key with the shaft bearing representations of grapes and grapevines, and the head of it has in vino on one side and veritas on the other, and uh, it's all parts of it are described as being perpetually dusty, and handling the outer case has been known to cause staining of the skin, and the gimmick here is that when 3634 is used to open a container of alcohol, the liquid within becomes an instance of dash A. 3634-A is chemically indistinguishable from a non-anomalous liquid of the same type, but individual instances have been noted to taste sweeter, and individuals who drink the dash A become compelled to speak truthfully in all circumstances for as long as dash A remains in their system. So we have the uh, sort of title and the tool itself that says In Vino Veritas, so it uh, turns a container of alcohol into truth telling wine of sorts that's what i'm gathering from it so far and uh, the description goes on to say that unlike other truth serums uh, such as scp black box the dash a does not allow for the omission of details or simply the ability to not answer and rather individuals who imbibe the dash a are compelled to divulge random and compromising details about their lives from internal observations to offensive statements against those around them to actions they would normally not confess and particularly susceptible individuals will carry out behaviors considered taboo and this may be due in part to the alcoholic nature of dash a and we go to a note that says that uh, even individuals in the upper uh, to percentile on the cognitive resistance value index, and I believe I've seen that somewhere else on the wiki. Um, this CRV index, even the top 2% are susceptible to dash A, but this may be due to the natural CRV lowering effects of alcohol. The skip was apparently recovered in England, where it was given as part of a white elephant exchange, and the skip was used to uncork several bottles of champagne over the course of the night. Emergency services were eventually called following the ignition of a fire in the kitchen, and uh, upon arrival, it was found that all the guests in attendance had gotten into a brawl, which resulted in 56 injuries and three deaths. And uh, we go to Mobile Task Force Tau 8, titled 100 Drunk White Toddlers. Love the name. And we have, after this, a set of interview logs, and I'm not going to do these interview logs justice, but suffice it to say, they are absolutely hysterical. Um, this It's got this all very delightful uh, English humor, and I, uh, I'll i read a couple of uh, salient quotes here, uh, just so you get some idea of what we're uh, going through, because there's, there's quite a few of them. I think there, it looks to be about a dozen of them in this log. Uh, we have a subject named Isaac being interviewed by Agent Prince, and Agent Prince asks, Do you know why you're here? And he responds, All I did was steal some hors d'oeuvres and a bunch of the jewelry. Prince says, That's exactly why. What did you do with it all? I hid it. Where? In my stomach. Is it safe to eat gold? It is, but I'm pretty sure that the quartz you swallowed isn't. Let's get you to the hospital. I've always wanted to see what they taste like, is all. They always looked so tasty. You're 61. Any man can crave candy, damn it. So there's a, all in all, there's a, I, I, well, let's, let's see here. We've got, how many of these have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen of these interviews, uh, that are carried out. They're all really good. Um, they absolutely carry this piece. And this is uh, more or less where it ends, that uh, all members of Tau 8, which conducted the interviews, were disciplined for unprofessional behavior during the interviews. And in addition, Agent Trevor has been given additional psychological counseling. And uh, we, we basically end it there. Um, I don't want to get too into any of the logs in particular, because I do not have the proper accent to pull it off. I just wanted to give you uh, sort of an idea of how they're set up. Um they're they're really good the uh the dialogue is very fluid and uh very natural sounding we don't try to explain too many things about how the skip operates which i think helps it um it gives it uh sort of a, a bit of a throwback feel in the sort of simple delivery 
of the skip itself, but then it's combined with really, uh, really entertaining dialogue in these, uh, in these interview logs. Uh, I, I really did enjoy this and it is absolutely worth your time. Uh, it's not a terribly long read in the first place. Uh, and it is, uh, quite entertaining. I think you'll really enjoy it. Moving on, we have SCP-3841. It is titled Death and Rebirth and was written by Ninevolt. This is actually the first of two skips by Ninevolt that uh, made it into the seven this week. And the skip has no image at all. Uh, we have an object class of safe and procedures that indicate that cover stories attributing the debris ring around Loyton B to asteroid impacts and other non-anomalous stellar phenomena have been disseminated. Interesting first sentence, uh, really gets you, uh, in a certain mindset right away that we're dealing with, uh, having to cover up something at an astronomical level. Uh, it goes on to say that civilian astronomers are not expected to discover 3841 due to the planet's atmospheric haze, but in the event that it does occur, we will discredit any research through foundation run academic journals. And, uh, we additionally have, uh, four satellites and surface probes that have been deployed by Foundation Extrasolar Exploration Vessels to monitor Leighton B for signs of further activity, and it is classified as off-limits for potential human interstellar colonization in the near future. And that's the entirety of the procedures. Interesting way to get us started. The description indicates that 3841 designates the remnants of a halted K-class event, and this is... Uh, noted as event K3841. That makes sense. Uh, the event occurred on the exoplanet Leuton B. Uh, we have a footnote explaining where exactly that it was uh, or is, I suppose, and that the planet is predicted to have been highly Earth-like prior to this event. And uh, the exact details aren't, are not uh, are unclear, but it has resulted in the extinction of all life on the planet, including its native sapient civilization. And uh, goes on to say that the primary cause of the K-class event is presumed to have been SCP-3841 Omega. And this is done as like a dash Omega. So uh, going forward, the dash Omega is uh, an organism whose skeletal remains span two continents on Leuton B. And the cadaver is 3,300 kilometers long. What a visual an organism whose skeleton is 3,300 kilometers in length and hexapedal in nature, similar in structure to the bodies of the Loitenians that have two legs possessing feet that could act as graspers and that when alive, it had a skull with the same structure of Loitenian skulls with two lower jaws and an upper jaw. The entire head region on Dash Omega has been destroyed and fragments of it have been found in craters across the planet, in orbits around Leighton B, and in orbits around Leighton Star at the escape velocity of Leighton B. So really compelling imagery to uh, go into this, that we have this apocalyptically large organism. Um, and uh, just, I, I love how we're getting started on this. And... Uh, the substance that forms the skeleton is unknown, but we've not been able to penetrate its surface, and no amount of applied heat or force have caused any damage whatsoever. Um, there's decaying organic matter attached to the sides of the skeleton, holding some sections together, uh, but it's breaking down into a reddish-brown slurry, and uh, this slurry is filling former lakes and oceans, and uh, we expect this decay process to go on for another 50 years. Um, just, I really love the visuals that we're building up here. Um, there are structures of anomalous origin discovered in the vicinity of the Dash Omega. Uh, exploration teams found structures of concentric circles formed from thousands of Loitenian cadavers, all of which had been attached by a fusion of the limbs. Whew. Uh, skyscrapers have calcified organic growths formed from fused Loitenian bodies, um, extending in directions away from the crater's epicenter, and these reach lengths up to 0.6 kilometers and heights of up to 1 kilometer, many having collapsed recently. And Leighton B is barren as a result of this K-class event. There is no longer any living flora, fauna, or microscopic life, 
and all regions that contain liquid water are entirely dry. Uh, we have an, uh, an atmosphere now that's abundant in carbon dioxide and methane, and it forms a haze that encompasses the planet and blocks light from the star, and uh, radiation levels are consistent with those of global nuclear fallout. We have a footnote that indicates that uh, we have the presence of highly irradiated craters in the cities and previously inhabited locales, many of those near Dash Omega, and undetonated dud nuclear weaponry and emptied missile silos at discovered military sites. Um, so this uh, civilization was apparently capable of nuclear warfare. Uh, and we go on to explain that little knowledge exists on, on the Loitenian civilization, uh, but the observations indicate they were about the same level of advancement as modern humanity. Um, though we have no insight into their culture, we found book-like objects and computer systems, uh, but all of them contain cognitohazardous depictions of Dash Omega that induce vegetative states in organisms that view them. And the uh, there's a third footnote here that says that all of the cognito hazards that are present decreases the further away the source is from the Dash Omega's crater. Interestingly, all of the cadavers discovered to date lack a brain equivalent organ despite a cavity in the skull where a brain would fit. And most cadavers were found with their heads pointing in the direction of Dash Omega's crater. Uh, we don't really understand the K-class event or what happened. Uh, we have hypotheses. We initially suspected mass nuclear bombardment of the head, but uh, given that we have uh, tested nuclear equipment and uh, we don't find any weaponry on the planet that could have uh, caused such damage. So our leading hypothesis is that during the formation of Dash Omega, it gained so much mass that it generated a gravitational field sufficient enough to alter the orbit of a small moon and continued alterations from the field and further size uh, growth led to the moon's orbit intersecting with Dash Omega, resulting in it directly impacting the head. And this accidental death halted the K-class event, and it explains why we have such a wide debris field. Can you imagine this organism that's so massive that it generates its own gravity sufficient enough to pull a moon into its own head. Absolutely incredible visuals here. We're told that Loyton B is not expected to be habitable for the next hundred years, if ever. That's probably a reasonable assessment, given that it's uh, totally uh, unsupportive of life. Um, and we have an addendum that uh, regards the Dash Omega decay slurry alterations, and that from the years 2030 to 2033, I always like when we jump ahead in the future a little bit, uh, probes that had been continually analyzing the chemicals in Dash Omega uh, decayed matter slurry detected increasing quantities of chemicals similar in nature to amino acids, and that RNA and DNA equivalent structures soon emerged. And in 2034, single-celled organisms were observed, and as of 2035, colonies of multicellular organisms have formed in the slurry and the land bordering it. And these colonies primarily convert carbon dioxide to oxygen. So from the uh, wreckage, from the body of this Dash Omega, we have the origins of new life. And that is where we end the article. Um just for the sheer imagery of it, this skip is phenomenal. I really, I really love it. Um, we don't get too deep into things that don't matter. We are staying right on hammering away this awesome, awesome imagery. Uh, this is one, this is a, uh, the approach that's been taken to this is something that we, that I don't see very often where the story, the narrative is really minimal and it really is about pushing this, uh, astronomical and scale, uh, this larger than life visual. Um, it's really, really cool. Uh, this is a very, very easy plus one for me. Moving on, we have SCP-1322-J. It is titled A Whole New World and was written by Dr. Lycus. Um, we have no pictures to make any mention of, and it is an object class of Euclid. We have containment procedures that indicate that 1322-J is effectively self-containing, so minimal security is required. The break room is to be shut down indefinitely and restricted solely for testing. 
Testing is currently focused on gaining access to Dash 1, and should a containment breach of a dangerous anomaly or anomalies occur, extra guards will be assigned to prevent access to Dash 1. 1322J is described as a space-time anomaly, 2 meters in height and 1 meter across, located in Site-27's break room, leading to a parallel universe designated as Dash 1. Dash 1 appears to lead to an alternate foundation Site-27 break room. Dash 1 appears to be identical to baseline reality except for its chiral nature, and due to its effect, it is currently impossible for personnel to enter Dash 1 as their chiral counterparts will block them from entering. Attempts to collaborate with Dash 1 instances will prove fruitless from what appears to be a result of its anomalous chiral nature, and meaningful communication will prove impossible. And from here, we go to a series of tests whereby Researcher Barnes attempts to enter 1322J and collides with 1322J1 Barnes. Barnes attempts to enter the anomaly for 23 minutes, but is blocked by 1322J1 Barnes. Testing ends after 1322J1 Barnes becomes aggressive. Uh, test 2. MTF-8 of 15 chess players is ordered to enter 1322J by any means necessary. MTF-8 of 15 immediately entered hand-to-hand -hand combat with their counterparts. As expected, neither version of 8 of 15 made any progress. Testing was abandoned after 8 of 15 deployed grenades, resulting in three members requiring hospitalization. Test 3 involves a drone being deployed towards 1322J, and the drone is blocked by the alternate drone. The next test, a drone is taped on top of another drone and sent towards 1322J at, at speed in hopes that the impact will throw the top drone being taped on top of the other into the portal. Drone 1 is dislodged by Drone 2's impact and thrown into J1, but is blocked by its counterpart that experienced a matching flight pattern. Test 5. A D-Class is ordered to enter the portal on pain of immediate termination. The D-Class appeared confused about 1322J, insisting it was not anomalous. The D-Class refused to enter 1322J, and we have a break. It was reclassed as safe. Containment procedures, 1322J, is to be removed from the break room and put in secure storage. SCP-1322-J is an indestructible mirror, and in approximately 92.9832123% of humans, subjects are convinced that it is a portal to a highly interesting alternate universe. Researcher Barnes is quoted as saying, I'd like to offer my immediate resignation. End article. Uh, this thing is already at plus 90-something in like two days, uh, and... It's just, as the comments have echoed this, that it's just the right amount of stupid. Um, it is not too long. It doesn't overly play it out, but it does let you get to the punchline ahead of the skip if you're paying attention. Um, this was uh, this was really good. Um, jokes, uh, J articles are alluring for a lot of uh, first-time writers because they think they just have to be funny. They're not. They have to tick all the boxes of a regular skip, and this does that. Um, there, it's posed reasonably well. We have our test logs, and it's funny on top of all of it. So very well done. Hitting triple digits inside a week is going to be well earned. Moving on, we have SCP-4801. This is titled Echidna Enthusiast and was written by Kindly Turtle Rock, who has been on an absolute tear. I have covered, I want to say, four skips in three weeks now, or maybe three in two weeks. In any event, he is absolutely, or she, they, I actually don't know, um, but whoever they are, they are on fire. They are on an absolute hot streak. And uh, we are greeted with an image of uh looks like uh, an old timey uh zeppelin or uh something of that nature um it's got warships uh looks like old uh world war 1 era planes uh in the background of it and uh we have a caption that reads a vehicle that resembles SCP-4801-1-08 found in the book France in the 21st century uh we have an object class of Keter and our containment procedures indicate that a strike team and MTF Gamma 97 Polaris Nail are to monitor for information leaks on interstellar object 1I-2017 U1 or Oumuamua. Public relations managers are to censor and filter anomalous details on xenomorphic spacecraft logged by space observatories. 
and these details are to be condensed into acceptable and mainstream observations for the scientific community. And this applies to any observations made on the constellation of Lyra. And level three psychologist, familiar with 4801's mental condition, as per Project EC Directorate, are to communicate with 4801. They're to critique Dash 1 instances in bad faith and direct them away from Earth in order to prevent XK impact event scenario. Interesting start. Um, I have no no idea where we're going with this at first glance. We're dealing again with uh, astronomy level stuff, but we also have psychologists being involved. So uh, we also have in the procedures that Opolodorus Mark 1 through 11 are to monitor inbound and outbound communications to 4801, and they're to snapshot visual logs of 4801's various states during Dash 1 construction. And the first sentence of the description is that SCP-4801 is a sapient echidna, and it measures 1,257 kilometers in radius, and orbits Vega, a star located in the constellation of Lyra, at an average distance of 1.3 AU. Huh. And not remotely, even with the name, not remotely where I thought we were going with this. The skip is curled into an oblate sphere, presumably as a defensive position, and its surface area is aligned with Dyson panels composed of carbon nanotubes. It allows for an absorption rate of roughly 341 yottawatts, which, believe it or not, is an actual uh, unit of measurement. I believe that is a million terawatts or a billion gigawatts. Uh, of solar radiation, which fuel the organic megastructure, um, and that spinal columns that stand atop this echidna hold spacecraft designated Dash 1 instances, which are incubated for a period of time. And we have a footnote that indicates that it is analogous to the incubation period for non anomalous echidna eggs to mature, and that no Dash 1 instance is purely mechanical. Inanimate components are grafted on, but they're crafted in adjacent chambers within the spinal column. Um, really bizarre imagery going on here. We go into the life cycle of a Dash 1 starting as a fetal mass, and we get into. Uh, two pretty sizable paragraphs that uh, basically just cover all of it. And the thing is, it's almost it's, a, it's almost a little too much information. It's uh, talking about how exactly things get attached and uh, all the various little stages of it. And it's good for building the backstory. It's actually uh, maybe a little too much and maybe slows this thing down uh, more than it actually helps. Uh, we go into that 34% of Dash 1s may become Dash 2 satellites that orbit SCP-4801 and they can uh, receive and produce radio frequencies between 30 megahertz and 30 gigahertz that appear to travel at super luminal velocities and that 4801 may conduct rapid partial conversations with terrestrial communication relays via anomalous transponders and the other 66% of the Dash 1 instances exit the Lyra system at escape velocity. And uh, they, these various spacecraft are built based on what this echidna believes is capable of astronautical navigation. And that as it lifts off, it'll shed exteriors made of bone and water ice and amniotic fluid and... Uh, eventually the spacecraft will attempt to move through space with whatever method of acceleration it has. And we go into a list of several designated uh, spacecraft that have been observed, and this is really good. Uh, for example, 4801 1-02 is described as 67 automobiles stacked on top of one another with unknown adhesives, immediately each dispersed towards different directions post-launch, and the word Voltron was indented on the license plate of a truck. And Dash 03 is described as the replica of the SpaceX Dragon with regenerating Falcon Heavy rockets made of bone and sinew. Fleshy sacks experience immediate deflation and then rupture. Blood clots, cranium in the shape of a rocket head and vertebra, experienced immediate expulsion. And the attached commercial resupply service capsule was completely unharmed. We also have a uh, replica of the Soyuz 1 
uh, with over 1,971, interesting, over 1,971, uh, like 1,972, I suppose, augmented Soyuz 11A511 rockets. So a rocket with over, with almost 2,000 other rockets strapped to it. Uh, all of them experienced catastrophic failure, uh, significant gamma ray bursts, and electromagnetic radiation consistent with exoatmospheric nuclear explosions were also noted. There's quite a few of these, um, and they are uh, it, it, they're really well done. We have a, a yellow submarine with four humanoid figures looking out. Um, the humanoids are estimated to be six kilometers in height, and uh, we go from this very uh entertaining set of descriptions into a goi format from the goc uh very interesting quite sudden shift in tone to the work and this document essentially lays out an agreement between the goc and the foundation with regards to containing this anomaly the goc's concerns toward this are restricted to redirecting any and all of these anomalous spacecraft away from Earth. And the GOC basically hammers out an agreement with the Foundation that includes things like uh, pooling resources, uh, research, documents on technology for uh, astronomical observation, uh, and logging activities, and maintaining containment protocols, and maintaining communications. Uh, this entire thing is done as a collaborative effort between the GOC and the Foundation per this document. And we go from that into uh, abbreviated transcripts uh, that go into an interaction that we have with 4801. Now, one thing that I... Uh, honestly dislike in this piece is that we go into um, one of these summaries of how we've come to uh, observe this thing over time and observe the uh, various spacecraft that have gotten too close to earth to uh, be all that comfortable with and that we establish first contact uh, there is a 20 second burst of radio signals detected and deciphered from morse code we rely a lot on Morse code for this stuff, and I really actively dislike it as a method for explaining these things away. Um, as far away as this thing is from us, and as relatively recently as Morse code was created, there's simply no way in hell. And I could see almost any other explanation being used, and or nothing at all. All you know, saying that it was deciphered and not elaborating further. Uh, or if you want to say that it was deciphered through some, uh, you know, heuristic method of uh, really anything. I don't care. Uh, uh, Morse code is played out. I don't think it was ever a great explanation to begin with. But at this point in time, certainly, we need to stop using it for Im impractical things like this. In any event, the addendum continues. We have a transcript uh, where we're seeing one half of the of a conversation, and it has to do with this uh, spacecraft presumably uh, calling home, and uh, we have all these sort of one-word sentences. Uh, query, location, suspect, father, edge, universe, and so on and so on. Uh, request, please, review, child scout and uh the addendum continues laying out the uh timeline of mtfs being established and the agreements with the goc being uh set up and we have another transcript where uh it appears to be between uh the spacecraft and the uh whole the the echidna again and uh we have where it's asking uh, essentially asking the parent if it's pleased and we are uh, trying to determine whether or not the parent is angry at the scout and finally we have a transcript of two-way communication between a psychologist and 4801 uh, the researcher reaches out uh, assuming that the entity is not going to answer but it does uh, we try to determine why radiation waves were sent from the scout towards earth and uh, trying to determine, and trying to determine what the reason for it is, we get an answer uh, to 
to that it was used to probe the world for information and that space capability is null and it asks us the Kardashev scale and this is a uh, concept that dates back to the 60s uh, where we have these uh, type 1, 2, and 3 civilizations that uh, where it's uh, based on how readily a civilization can harness energy from its surroundings, whether it's from a star or a whole solar system and that sort of thing. So it's asking us basically where we stand on the Kardashev scale. Now, again, this is a conceit where we are introducing things that are very native to Earth and have really no explanation why this entity would be in possession of information like this. So this did actually pull me out of the immersion a little bit. Um, we're trying to determine what exactly it's getting at and making some assumptions on the fly as to why it's scanning in this way uh, and then returns to ask the entity uh, did you mean why is earth incapable of sending space vessels into space for prolonged expedition and it answers yes past collaboration many colonies and there is mention made of 4801's father and it becomes very uh, agitated and very angry and that we are uh, then led to find out that 4801 intends to uplift earth and it goes you know goes on a bit further we have uh, where it's asking if we have a docking station and uh, come to believe that it thinks we may be a spaceport and that one of these uh, spacecraft may attend to may attempt to land on earth which it's not going to be able to do and could very well cause uh, the the end of all life on earth a uh, you know just by it being an impact from a an object of that size and we may, we think that it may be recycling words that it's picked up from Earth through some unelaborated means, this radiation that it sent out, uh, presumably in some way was able to glean information from however it came about doing this. Um, we ask that uh, we will try to help provide advice and critique on these creations of yours, these spacecraft, provided you never send one directly to us and that we prefer examining from afar. And it says, basically, no, Father always knows best. And uh, we ask if there are any other fathers that have been found in the scout's travels. And it uh, says, nonsense, father, only father, made son, works, grand. And it rambles for a bit longer and ends with query, suspect, father, capable, builder, desire, become. End article. So this work covers a lot of ground. Um, we are taken all over the place over the course of the article from a fairly traditional start with uh, sort of test logs and reviewed uh, creations from the skip into a GOI format. This really, and honestly, a very well done uh, document crafted for the GOC and then this uh, series of interviews that are uh, done in a fairly unique format. It's uh, not quite the same format that uh, Kindly Turtle Rock used previously in uh, one that we covered last week uh, for black. I'm sorry for dark body intelligences, and that one is let's see here SCP-4170, and I covered that one in part one of the week 52 recap, uh, around 20 minutes in. So it, it covered a lot of ground, and all in all, I think it did all of it very well. I found it overall to be uh, quite immersive and did a good job of keeping me interested in what was going on as it went closer to the uh, end of the article here. There are those little things that I mentioned that, uh, you know, making use of Morse code and asking about the Kardashev scale, we do have uh, something of an explanation for that, for it uh, potentially picking up words from scanned entities. Um, and that it can also do so at uh, faster than light speeds. Uh, but I feel like overall that's a lot of explanation for a fairly minor contribution to the work. 
and that does affect the uh, pacing of this thing at times. Uh, all that said, still very worthy of a place on the wiki. I think it handles uh, the immersion aspect well, and uh, outside of those things that I've touched on, uh, I, I like it. I think this is a, a reasonably easy plus one for me. Moving on, we have SCP-3597, titled Maladroit, and written by AIS Mallard. Uh, it has no image attached and an object class of Euclid. Uh, the procedures indicate that 3597 is to be kept in its containment chamber within provisional site 597. Uh, any D-class assigned to the project must be permanently relocated inside the chamber, and D-Class may request supplies or additional personnel, provided no justification is given. Huh. And other than such requests, no people or coherent information may enter or leave the chamber. Two slats have been built into the structure, which are used for delivery of food and waste, and any additional personnel must first be administered grade Z permanent dosages of class H and I amnestics. Now, I spoke with AIS Mallard on this, and he elaborated also in the comments that, uh, the classes are actually relevant to this work. I'm not going to go too into the weeds on the backstory, but those two were chosen out of the uh, info pages regarding amnestics very specifically as it pertains to the work. The description is data expunged, and this is why I chose this work this week. I have only once seen this in 10 years uh, having the entire description expunged. This is an incredibly risky play given how the wiki operates. This is above all the thing you don't do. You don't expunge whole sections. It's just not done. Uh, I suppose the only bigger sin would be expunging the containment procedures. So this, when I saw it, it was immediately like, huh, it's a bold move, Cotton. And I was very interested to see where it went from here. So we go from the description being expunged directly into a recovery log that uh, indicates that we flagged an unusual sequence of civilian and police deaths linked to Black Box Preschool in New York, New York. And Pi-1 City Slickers was sent in to investigate. Pi-1 is a very long-running MTF. Uh, they have been right in the heart of anything, particularly as it pertains to New York City. Um, and what we have is a log of MTF Pi-1 attempting to enter the building, and uh, essentially they cannot. Uh, at first, they report intense migraines, and we abort 13 minutes pass. Uh, they try through the second story window. They report intense migraines and nosebleeds, and they abort uh, another hour and 21 minutes pass. They attempt to enter with gas masks. Two members expire and the operation is aborted again. We have a footnote that indicates that the coroners that attempted the autopsy suffered from internal hemorrhaging and also expired before they were able to communicate the cause of death. So we haven't attempted any further autopsies at this time. Uh, so another 30 minutes or so pass, they attempt to enter the building blindfolded and successfully gain access, and three members report tinnitus and one member is hospitalized and after another three minutes they attempt to explore the building still blindfolded and they report intense migraines severe tinnitus and blood loss two members expire and one self terminates and the operation is aborted so pi one over the course of two hours and five minutes is absolutely flattened by this building um i feel like i should point out it's uh a uh, cliche con entry. This uh, does fit the bill of a highly skilled MTF being steamrolled. Uh, so what we have next is uh, another mobile task force. This is A to 10, see no evil, uh, which is another long pedigree of a mobile task force being deployed. Uh, those members are all blind. Uh, they are initially briefed on the previous recovery attempts and members begin to report he minor head pain. Three minutes pass, they attempt to enter the building, and members report intense migraines and blood loss. One member is hospitalized, and we abort. Thirteen minutes pass, they consume Class A amnestics and attempt to enter the building and successfully gain access with four members reporting minor head pain. Thirteen more minutes pass, 
They attempt to explore the building and an unattended toddler is discovered in the play area. A footnote reveals that the, uh, upon examination, the child appears to be in normal condition. However, medical staff complained of head pain. Uh, another 11 minutes pass. A to 10 exits the building, and after being equipped with external oxygen supplies and ear protection, they re-enter and report minor head pain. Another 12 minutes pass. They attempt to explore the building. More head pain. Another 9 minutes pass. They arrive in the kitchen. Three members expire, and the remaining members are in critical condition. Operation is aborted. Really, really fascinating stuff, given that we have absolutely no description on what's going on. We have to piece it together through these logs. This is a really, really cool way to uh, to do this, particularly with the data expunge description gimmick. Um, this is a fantastic way to go about it. Uh, after Sino Evil is extracted from the building, the uh, staff outside attempt to question the recovered toddler. The child's unaware that there were no other living people in the building, and when asked about the behavior of the caretakers, the child began crying and bleeding profusely, and staff present experienced nausea and blood loss. Medical staff administered Class A amnestics and hospitalized the affected. And at this point, command authorizes the use of D-class personnel. Haha, ha, there's the next element in the cliche. And all personnel were given sensory deprivation helmets with an external oxygen supply. And because of the suspected effects, personnel were not briefed. So we begin with a D-class entering the building, and he enters the kitchen and has only minor tinnitus. Uh, that D-class exits. Uh, two more enter with plywood and wood glue and then enter the building and command instructs them to build a container. They successfully enter the kitchen and successfully mark out an area for the container but complain of haziness and lack of focus. Uh, another 14 minutes pass, a third D-class who has passed construction experience enters the building with supplies and they attempt to assist but say they feel that their mind is full of cotton and no construction progresses. So a fourth D-class enters, and due to interaction with an unspecified skip, they have minimal sensitivity in their limbs and frequently lose awareness of the limbs. They were equipped with a flamethrower and instructed to incinerate any cadavers. Um, they report success and noted an intuitive understanding of their surroundings despite the helmet. Really, really cool. Uh, the way that I think we're going with this is something that I have not seen before. Um, another 17 minutes pass. Uh, the uh, aforementioned D-class with uh, sensitivity lacking in their limbs with the flamethrower uh, exits the building. They are data expunged. And two staff members expire, five are hospitalized, and security personnel terminate that D-class and incinerate the remains. At this point in time, another D-class enters the building. Their file notes that they were an entertainer, and they're generally regarded as affable. And personnel report that... Uh, after entering that that D-class is hurting morale, uh, but he was successful in constructing two container walls. Another D-class is administered Class I amnestics, equipped with thick mittens and given 80 centimeter stilt shoes, and we have a footnote that says that they have no previous experience using stilt shoes and enters the building. They also have prior brain damage, and uh, the result of this is that despite difficulties entering the building, the D-Class reports clarity of mind while working on the task and claims to be highly productive. And lastly, the personnel requests several items. Another D-Class is administered Class I amnestics and is sent into the building with the requested supplies and apparently making use of said materials. This D-Class, I'm sorry, another D-Class reports that preliminary containment had been achieved. I love how much of this is being left unsaid. Uh, this is such a delicate line to walk, but they're doing a really, really good job of it, of trying to explain what's going on without giving it away. And uh, after these logs, we have that the building was condemned by agents within the New York City Department of Buildings and rebuilt as provisional site 597. Uh, during this process, a standard humanoid containment chamber was built around the former kitchen area and the site was acquired by a foundation front, and procedures were formalized, and a doctor declared this skip contained. And afterwards, all personnel not inside the chamber were amnesticized and transferred to different projects. Guard and this is actually a link to SCP-4339. Uh, guards with no knowledge 
of 3597 except for its containment procedures were stationed within site 597 and to date there have been no breaches end article so what we have here is an anomaly whereby your experience or familiarity with something becomes inverted and I suppose also your ability to do something also becomes inverted. So what we have is a not one but two highly skilled task forces trying to do things they're very good at and effectively killing themselves in the process of trying to do their jobs. Meanwhile, we can send in D-class and have them work out exceptionally well to the point that we can successfully contain the skip. This was really, really well done. And it also fully explains the gimmick. We have totally expunged the description because the less we know about it, the more effective we are at containing it. Uh, this is so very good. I am... I... I <laughs> I don't have enough good things to say about this. This is one of those where every time I have any sort of thought that we might have covered everything there is to cover, I see something like this where it's a simple concept. It's executed so well that it gives me just such a great sense of optimism for the wiki going forward. Very easy plus one. Very well done. Moving on, we have a rare treat. We have a Series 1 rewrite to cover this week. This is SCP-351. It is titled Read Only Memory, and this was a uh, co-write between Ninevolt and Meserach. And this is uh, quite lengthy. Uh, there is no image attached to it. We have an object class of Euclid. And uh, indications in the procedures that all copies of 351 are to be stored in secure foundation databases with access only available to the memetics division. And if testing is to be performed, a blank copy of 351 consisting solely of dash one will be used to neutralize the anomaly's effects in the test subject and potentially compromised personnel. We have two Foundation bots that are programmed to scan online websites for the appearances of 351 copies, and found copies are to be downloaded and then removed from the sites under standard online anomaly containment protocols. This is another one of those nice ways where you don't have to explain too much about how we're getting something off the internet. This is the standard online anomaly containment protocol. Uh, Mobile Task Force Phi 13 EOT has been tasked with halting mass memory alteration in the event that 351 affects large portions of the populace. Well, that sounds like quite a tall order. Uh, task force agents have to follow standard memetic quarantine protocols and are equipped with electronics that display blank copies, which must be viewed on a twice daily basis. And testing to determine the limitations of the anomaly's implanted memories is underway. So that wraps up our procedures. Uh, fairly menacing. Uh, sounds like the stakes are fairly high with this skip. The description indicates that 351 is an ASCII plain text .txt file containing a virulent memetic agent which implants false memories visualized as ASCII art. And we have a footnote here explaining what ASCII art is uh, for those that aren't aware, basically using uh, your standard alphabet and uh, ASCII set characters, which is uh, basically everything you see on your typical keyboard, uh, into a, uh, a representation of some work of art. And the primary component of the anomaly is the dash one, which is a string of 30 characters, which does not correspond to characters in any known encoding standard, which converts the entire file into a memetic vector. Now, I have mentioned in previous episodes that I am an IT guy. I've been doing it for about 15 years. Uh, this, to my standards, is not an acceptable explanation. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the hell it's coded at. There are certain things that a processor is going to do or not do, and none of them are going to cause this. Uh, I 
more or less knew what I was getting into with the skip in the beginning. Uh, I have not a ton of immersion when we get into things uh, posed this particular way anyway. Uh, so we will move on uh, for what they're trying to do for describing it as a text file. There is probably no acceptable way for a particularly crusty IT nerd to uh, explain away the situation. Um, but it goes on to say that additional text added to the file is the basis for the false memories that 351 implants with the level of detail the text has corresponding to the level of detail subjects can recall from the memories. And all of these memories are recalled identically and are resistant to all amnestic treatments and effects. That's interesting. Uh, copies of the file display the same properties, but exposing uh, subjects to 351 or a copy lacking any text info other than that string results in the memory being replaced by a blank memory entirely removing it. And this serves as the primary method of removing the infection. And despite the clear recall of these memory subjects report that they lack the immediacy and richness of other memories, it's theorized that this is the result of strings of text the memories are based on lacking all of the sensory uh, inputs that normal memories are based on and subjects that have been compromised by the files which are designated as dash b instances are capable of implanting their false memories into persons they associate with such as friends or colleagues and conversations uh, of any medium involving an instance will result in the instance inevitably discussing memories from 351 turning the conversation into a mimetic vector so we have uh, another of these sort of uh, mimetic viruses uh initiating where our payload is a text file and it affects a human and the human is then uh, compelled in some manner to spread this onto others and uh, the description goes on to say that beyond the addition of previously non-existent memories uh, the dash b experience few other cognitive effects and individuals behave as they would prior to infection when not in conversation with uninfected individuals and questions regarding any ways that the memories might conflict is met with disregard. Um, we have uh, other symptoms of lethargy and apathy being observed in Dash B instances at significantly higher rates than the unexposed population. So that's a lot to absorb, but I think it does a reasonably good job of running through it uh, in a concise manner to set out all of the things that this skip has to do to work in the story. We go into some uh, addenda that cover text samples that have been recovered from uh, various places where we've retrieved these dash A instances, these mimetic payloads, and uh, we have two of them in this first addendum. Uh, the second is the subject of a related interview, so the uh, text file is uh, basically indicating that uh, you weren't driving drunk, you didn't run a red you and your wife were both okay nothing happened and the celebration from the one-year anniversary happened like it was supposed to and everything was wonderful and it wasn't your fault and this was found on the personal computer of somebody after her suicide so what we go into is an interview between an undercover agent and the interviewee who was a uh, co-worker, I believe, from the uh, looks of it. And the implication here is that the interviewee has been exposed via the uh, mimetic vector that the uh, deceased that wrote this uh, virus uh, subjected them to. So the interview is really interesting because it goes into uh, inevitably steering the subject back towards that file um, immediately you know going in oh yeah that's where I met uh, her wife did I mention uh, you know how how great everything was the party was great and she didn't go through a window um, and the agent responds yes it was a great party uh, even though she very clearly couldn't have been there and then it gets a little more off the rails a little more off the rails um, and it says uh you know, describing her. She was like 5'2", mousy brown hair, kind of straight up and down, just like a Unicode 007C vertical line, you know? Uh, so the implication here is that these, uh, these memories are somewhat confined to the 
to a textual representation. I won't say the ASCII standard because uh, I'm going to put my IT nerd hat back on. Unicode is not part of the ASCII standard. It's a totally separate thing. Um, but I'll digress. We'll keep going. Um, the interview continues. They go more and more down this rabbit hole of just uh, the agent being totally pulled in and at the very end, we have the agent saying, that's right, she saw the road fine, her lights were on. To which the interviewee replies, her lights were on, and it wasn't her fault. End log. Um, really, really good, really compelling interview um, for as off the rails as this thing must go to sell the skip. I think the dialogue's still really natural, um, and natural is a hard qualification for what we're getting into, but no, it's, it's, it's really good. I really like it. Um, we then have, uh, the second addendum, which is an experiment log. And what we're basically doing is, uh, we have D class that are, uh, infected and we insert these, uh, anomalous memories. And, uh, we start with describing, uh, a paragraph describing a green eyed black and white cat said to be one that the subject currently owns. And the subject visualized the cat as being cat-shaped with ASCII characters forming an outline of its body, fur patterns and shading. All characters were grayscale except for the eyes, which were irises of at signs. The color green was not mentioned, suggesting grayscale visualization of the memories. And past tense yielded the same results, though with an inability for the subject to describe why they no longer own the cat, uh, presumably because we didn't explain why in the paragraph. Um, We go through a few of these and... uh, It uh, tests a couple things. We translate it into Spanish to see what happens. Um, We go into disturbing encounters and get low-level fear responses. And the more we describe it, the more intensity uh, is exhibited in that fear response. Um, And we go through a couple more tests. And this is all being done on D-Class. So we end with the text used in its entirety reads, You have never doubted the Foundation. You have always been loyal to the Foundation. And the subject was found to be agreeable with foundation protocols such as containment and the maintenance of the veil. And the ambivalence regarding D-class testing was not wholly removed. Uh, Experiments using longer and more detailed text to further alter personality traits are planned. And we have a note that says continued tests of this nature are currently forbidden by order of the Ethics Committee. Uh, One thing that I really like about this is since this is a Series 1 rewrite, we're actually being quite faithful to how things would have worked in series one. Uh, that's not necessarily something I was going to take for granted with these rewrites, uh, because it's, it's something that is a, a, a vague sort of thing to capture. You know, we can point to skips that have done it well, but, you know, summing it all up and still making a new work out of it. Um, that's, that's really impressive. I, I really like how we've uh, gone about this so far. And finally, we go to a third addendum, which reads Project Tin Man, and it uh, explains that a particular researcher was performing standard monitoring of SCP-9906, I like that, when the anomaly's cognitohazardous properties bypassed all mimetic filtration systems, converting this researcher into a mimetic vector, and that before a containment breach could ensue, they injected all available amnestics in their vicinity, and she exposed herself to experimental antimimetic glyphs. And the cumulative effect of everything was the complete erasure of her personality, memories, and all mental faculties, or almost all mental faculties, I should say, and this induced an effective vegetative state. And after being connected to life support, we found no methods by which she could be returned to her prior state. So we uh, sought out and gained approval for the experimental use of 351 in Project Tin Man, which is where correspondence from co-workers, personal journal entries, and all database information was compiled and written into a 50,000-word text file. And once we had everything that we could find, uh, the text was added to a specially designated copy, and on uh, a certain day, the researcher was exposed to the file, and initially only slight Limb movements were performed, but after an hour, she began to pace around her room, and we conducted an interview the following day. So, really interesting project. I can see uh, quite clearly the you know the imagery of, of us trying to uh, trying to do anything to bring this person back. 
partly, uh, you know, potentially out of uh, a sense of duty to the researcher, but also because we have uh, unanswered questions in our testing protocols. So we proceed into an interview and uh, the interview takes up most of the rest of the work. We, we begin with the uh, researcher uh, being very slow to respond to questioning and uh, has no facial expressions, answers everything in a very monotone uh, sort of way, and said that she didn't, you know, I don't see the need to speak much. Succinct is always better. And the interviewer says, well, that is identical to part of what we wrote in the file, but you, you uh, aren't wrong there. The interviewer asks if she remembers who her husband is, and she replies yes, gives his name, and says that she would never forget. The interviewer asks about uh, remembering the marriage, and everything is, you know, described exactly how it was written in the text file, with uh, little exceptions, those little unsettling details. Uh, She says the sun was a shining ring of dashes. And the tree's leaves were thousands of swaying angle quotes that kept fluttering off. The wind was chilly. The clouds were puffy brackets. It was a beautiful day. And uh, it keeps going. And we're basically coming to the conclusion that she can't remember anything at all that wasn't explicitly laid out in the document. And the uh, interviewer goes on to let the... Uh, researcher know that her husband died and the smile very slowly shifts into a frown researcher says she's distraught how could this happen oh god Um, the interviewer says i was laying back and staring at the asterisks in the sky but is this all could you please please think about the rest of your time with him can it get anything else out of you and It gets, you know, a little more intense as we go on towards the end. And uh, we end with two lines reading where the researcher says, I loved him more than anyone else in the world. And the interviewer says, I loved him more than anyone else in the world. I'm sorry. And we end the log there with the interviewer exiting the chamber and the researcher continuing to stare at the space that the interviewer was formerly in, frowning, and no other movements are made. And in a state of distress, the interviewer exits the chamber without viewing the blank on the computer terminal, breaching standard security protocols. And this results in the mimetic spread of the memory constructs to all present Project Tin Man personnel until site security was alerted and dispatched. And usually upon exposure to these blanks, the affected personnel experience a near complete loss of memories regarding uh, whatever it is. But in this case, the memories were so similar to the actual memories that both became connected and we have effectively lost the original memories upon the interviewer. So the interviewer has been removed from all related research. New security protocols have been implemented to prevent repeat of incidents um, and Project 10 Man has been considered a failure. However, the uh, researcher that is a uh, had to go through all this has proven useful in isolated environments that prevent mimetic spread and following revisions to the text file that removed information regarding emotions and added loyalty increasing text this researcher can consistently perform activities beneficial to mimetics research on a daily basis and assuming plans for life support systems that will provide health assistance to subjects are completed the researcher is expected to be capable of serving the foundation indefinitely end article That is a real punch to the gut to end this thing. Like, we've been going back and forth on whether or not this is done out of a sense of, uh, you know, feeling like we owe the researcher something for the awful circumstances or whatever the case may be. And the end leaves you with no doubt. This is out of, you know, a very simple uh, self-serving sort of situation that we've got here. Uh, We are basically engineering this text file, this this infectious mimetic virus, in such a way with this particular person that is effectively a clean slate and can have nothing but these very limited memories attached to them and we can use them for uh, memetic research indefinitely. Uh, That is very much in the vein of that cold, not cruel foundation that I think is really, really compelling when we try to challenge that concept. Uh, This is really, really well done. I think for uh, 
being in series one where it's going to be seen for posterity, I think this is a tremendous addition. Um, it does everything it set out to do with absolutely flying colors. Really well done. And last but not least, we have SCP-4434. This is titled Anglerfish, and it was written by Cyan Truce. Um, we have a couple of images that are visible uh, on the top half of this page. Um, the first one is a black and white image of uh, what looks to be three deer, uh, either female or too young to have any horns. One is uh, appears to be rushing the cameraman. Uh, this was a night shot, so they've all got uh, glowing eyes, and there's a bit of motion blur uh, in the foreground. The caption reads, SCP-4434 Charlie pursuing a subject. And the second uh, image that's visible is uh, it's a, an image of some trees, and there is red text overlaid on the, uh, on the picture here. Uh, it says a black box and road. So it looks like it's supposed to be maybe uh, an address or something that's all on the same line, uh, but only road is visible. And uh, in the center of the screen in red text, it says, get away, get away, get away, get away, get away. And then at the bottom in red text, it says, find what? And then a very long black box that covers the uh, rest of the image. Um, it looks to be like, uh, Southern American woodlands. Uh, this was looked, looked similar to the, the trees and vegetation that I'd seen, uh, living in Kentucky and Tennessee for a while of, uh, that sort of forested look. Um, we have pre uh, containment procedures that indicate that outpost 4434 has been constructed adjacent to AOE 4434, for the purposes of research and surveillance, and is designed to house 15 or fewer personnel for long-term assignment. That, I think, is the first time I've seen AOE actually used in a skip that has made it to the positives. Um, normally, I'll see that in the context of the uh, very spooky, scary murder monsters that uh, tend to be inserts that hope to make it into Containment Breach or some other game. Uh, but this is uh, apparently not that big of a, a knock to the skip using AOE. And uh, presumably there is some area of effect that makes sense for it to be designated as such. Um, we have, da as Dash A instances manifest irregularly and can't be accurately tracked or predicted, uh, containment efforts are dedicated to preventing entry into the property. Um, there's signage around the perimeter posted and at the driveway entrance to the property uh, stating that trespassing is prohibited. Uh, and Persons who successfully arrive at the address via Dash A and exhibit signs of, cogn of cognitohazardous influence are to be detained until after the effects subside. Uh, class B amnesticization is mandatory for release. Uh, detained persons who are not anomalously affected and appear to be trespassing uh, may be transferred to Site 42, Site 626, or into the custody of state law enforcement. And that is the end of our procedures. So um, that it says it's on a driveway is the thing that stuck out to me. And combine that with the uh, black box of a road, it sounds like we're dealing with a, uh, a house or something of that nature. So uh, let's go on to the description, which explains that 4434 is the designation for a group of interconnected anomalies, which is detailed as follows, and that 4434 is located in or under or potentially is non-physically associated with a small valley on a remote plot of private land south of Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, and that from an elevation of 65 meters above sea level downward, a theoric resonance imaging indicates a high concentration of thaumaturgic particles, and we have a footnote that explains what that is, and that these particles have settled in the valley, and they are now stationary, and this is referred to as AOE-4434, and the skip has four components, the dash A, which is advertisements which manifest temporarily in the West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, tri-state area on billboards in print and digitally, they contain a class 2 textual cognito hazard with a short-term compulsion effect. It provides the address of AOE 4434 and apparently compelled the subject to seek it out. I feel like it's worth mentioning right now this is a cliche con entry if this all sounds a little too hacky. Um, that hopefully provides some clarity there. Um, when we photograph these advertisements, it is displayed as blank white space and 
the uh, figure that I described as the uh, red text and so on is a non-anomalous recreation of one such advertisement. The dash B is one amorphous entity, likely sapient and capable of vocalization in at least four languages. It appears to the naked eye as singular or multiple living organisms with form based upon a concept or memories considered personally significant to the subject, and it convinces the subject to descend further into the AOE and into the range of dash C. Dash C, which uh, we described as the pictures of the deer uh, at the beginning of this, are 25 entities physically similar to deer and behaviorally similar to canine pack animals. They're sentient, they cannot manifest above a height of 50 meters from sea level, and will lethally attack and consume subjects before proceeding into dash D and re-manifesting the next time a subject is present. And dash D is described as a hole in the ground at the base of the AOE with a three and a half meter diameter and an unknown depth due to apparent anomalous spatial characteristics and drone exploration yields equipment failure before we can successfully transmit data and results of human exploration is detailed in the addenda. So four pieces that go into the skip, an advertisement that compels you to seek the thing out, an entity that lures you deeper into the area, and 25 hunting deer that will lethally attack, and then proceed into D, which is the hole in the ground of unknown depth. So a lot to try and keep track of in this one. We go on to uh, a current hypothesis as to the skip that it is a class 4 conceptual predator that uses its components to bait and consume prey via dash D, and this is based, however, on context obtained from the document included in Addendum 2 and can't be objectively confirmed. So keep that in mind, we'll come to Addendum 2 in a minute. And it's unknown if the skip is sentient or only some of its components are. Um, we have a brief history um, that uh, basically that we detected thaumaturgic abnormalities in the AOE immediately. Uh, we stationed personnel and constructed an outpost in July of 2009. We have we have a sort of a backstory here. Um, it doesn't look to be terribly uh, ter terribly relevant. Um, we explained that the property uh, didn't experience any abnormal events but was frequently the subject of fiction stories created by his daughter, who had a considerable interest in witchcraft and the occult. She fell into the nearby river and drowned a week before the effects manifested. And the uh, and this person claims that that daughter was likely the one that wrote the document transcribed in Addendum 2. So we've had two references to Addendum 2 before we go immediately into Addendum 1, which are experiment logs, where we essentially are sending uh, D-Class into to see what happens, um, and initially we send a D-class in, uh, has three different, uh, GPS locators attached and, uh, the dash B, the object of the person's desire or interest, uh, presented itself as the D-class's deceased dog and vocally imitated it while moving deeper into the AOE. The D-class was unresponsive to explanations of the anomaly and perceived it as legitimate, despite the fact that he had actively resisted entering the AOE beforehand. Uh, the D-class follows this dash B for 90 seconds before the dash C, the deer, attacked. And the results are the subject expired and all three GPS trackers remained active uh, following consumption. Two of the three remained active for 40 minutes uh, after entrance into the D and appeared to travel slowly in a sidewinding pattern before dropping further downward and disconnecting. Uh, our second test sent two D-class in basically to see what would happen and... Uh, how this dash B would manifest to multiple people. And in this instance, it manifested as a young male wearing business attire, telling both the D-class that it can help them eradicate their debt and expunge their criminal record. Uh, they do not comply with requests to return from the AOE and instead try to speak to the dash B. They were attacked by the dash C. 130 seconds later, both expired. And it appears that the affected subjects are not capable of leaving the AOE of their own accord even without the factor of having viewed the dash A instance, the advertisement beforehand. So we are slowly painting how exactly this thing uh, preys or hunts or whatever you want to call it. We have a third test to determine if subjects are compelled to stay in the AOE as soon as they're entering or only after contacting a dash B. And what we find that uh, 
it is reliant on the dash B. We have a D class uh, trying to be pulled out of the affected area, but the dash B, the object of the uh, D class's desire, uh, who is a middle aged woman, uh, which is not elaborated on further, uh, quickly drew a knife from its pocket and severed the rope. And the dash C, the deer arrived about 15 seconds later and the subject expired. So we're uh, building this thing up as maybe uh, quite a quite a lot more hostile than we initially gave it credit for. And lastly, we go into test four to determine the contents of the dash D, the hole. And this includes uh, one D class and one uh, B class, uh, who is apparently presented as a researcher of some sort in this, and the D class is rappelling downward into the hole. Um, I am not going to give you this whole thing because it's rather long, but the dialogue is very, very well constructed. This was probably my favorite dialogue of the week. Um, we do, uh, have them attempt to, uh, look around trying to figure out what they're in the middle of. Uh, they first think it's mud, dirt, and rocks, and, uh, they do get to the floor and, uh, figure out it is not dirt and mud it's too shiny it's too too soft it is flesh and uh they try to uh slice a bit off and uh they do also retrieve a piece of paper we have a footnote that says this document is transcribed in addendum two so that's the third reference we've had to addendum two after pulling a chunk off of the flesh it's uh it didn't react in any way um they eventually try to repel back up and uh, they make it out of the hole, though they're not sure uh, on the way up if there's anything waiting for them on the other side. Uh, they try to make a run for it, but uh, while she is uh, nearly made it out, uh, they they find that a platter of dinner food on a cloth napkin with utensils is noted to be present five meters to the D-class's right. Her attention turns to this. The D-class begins eating the food, and the subject is presumed expired as they descend further back into the AOE. We get the tissue sample retrieved. The tissue sample yields a 78.9% match to a species which is footnoted here as the deep sea anglerfish, and that further D-class testing is pending approval. And lastly, we have Addendum 2, which is simply titled Recovered Document, and it is given in the form of a poem, and it reads, The forest is a sea, the wind is the waves, and the water is the leaves. The streams become undercurrents, the birds become fish, and coral finds its home as fungus, growth sprouting as I wish. The ground is the shore, pulling me by the feet, dragging me down and pulling me back, back and forth on repeat. I dove down past the light, down where I couldn't breathe, and found nature looking for a fight. Yes, the forest is a sea, but I've made it barely big enough for me. The forest is a sea, so now something's bound to come eat. End article. That's where we leave it, and you take it all in consideration. The uh, The title maybe gives a little bit too much of it away too early, but that does not change that this was really well done. And additionally, I believe, contains the most of uh, the cliche categories at the same time that I've seen so far during this contest. Um, really, really did enjoy it. Um, even though there's a lot to try and keep track of, I feel like, um, I honestly feel like you could potentially either get rid of this Dash A advertisement entirely and maybe spend less time on it and manifest it as something that uh, people, sim simply people driving through the area, given that you've already set up this thaumaturgical valley, that uh, there's a latent compulsive effect. Uh, we don't necessarily need the advertisements as well. They could simply be compelled to go. Um, and I think that uh, also satisfies the uh, cliche con category of crazy to death. And uh, that would maybe simplify this a little bit and make it a little bit more readable. So you just have A, B, and C rather than A, B, C, and D. Um, but that said, for all of the things that it has to cover in the skip, it's actually really solid. Um, the second addendum, the poem, um, I've said it before, I don't consider myself all that creative. I would not attempt something like this, but I think this does quite well um, in uh, having this sort of deep forest anglerfish concept and uh, honestly really doing a great job with it. Um, 
don't have much else to say, not much else that I would change. Uh, this was really well done. And with that, we bring this show to a close for the week. There were a lot of skips to cover, and uh, as I indicated in uh, the beginning of this show, uh, going forward, uh, I plan to change the format of this up a little bit. Uh, my intent, as it stands right now, is to cover about seven articles a week. I may do that as seven skips, or I may try to do it as five to six skips and one to two alternate formats, be those tales or GOI formats, uh, or anything else that's notable, like an essay like we covered uh, last week. Uh, that's the plan, and hope you stick around to see how it goes. Um, I did mention in part one of this, uh, I have set up an IRC chat, and uh, if you want to join, ask questions, or follow along as I uh, make my way through these recordings, uh, it is on Sin IRC with the rest of the SCP channels, and the channel is SCP Cafe. Uh, if you have any feedback, as always, please let me know what you think. And uh, until next Friday, keep reading, keep writing, and uh, we'll see you next time around.